Thanks, thanks a lot for the previous panel. Um, it was, uh, you know, we have to have a, more discussions on sustainability. And actually, um, uh, I think in one of our previous forums, we had representations from, uh, I think, the IEEE Future Network Group and the Sustainability Work Group there. So uh, we as CWC are very committed to sustainability and would love to continue the discussions. Uh, thanks. So our last panel, wow. Uh, so our last panel is on uh, digital health. And um, we, you know, all of us uh, intimately use healthcare in, in various different forms. You know, many of us maybe don't have to, but, you know, many of us do. And uh, the question is that all the progress that is going on in terms of um, wireless technologies, especially mobile technologies, sensing technologies and AI, uh, there's obviously a lot going on there and how is it going to impact healthcare and specifically digital health? So that would be the question that we'll be asking and discussing uh, with an esteemed panel here. So what I would like to do is have the panelists just uh, introduce themselves very briefly, 90 seconds each of you, uh, and also to discuss or, or to you know, let us know about which aspects of these three things, right? Mobile technology, sensing technologies, and AI that you might be have specialized in, and or you know what you have, what have you seen in terms of digital health, uh, and what have you done? What what has been your role in this context? And then we'll get into more discussions. Thanks. Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, absolute pleasure to be here. Thank you, Dr. Day. Thank you, fellow panelists. Uh, looking forward to a lively discussion. Uh, my name is Sanjeev Avnani. I'm a senior cardiologist at uh, Scripps Clinic just across the street. Competitor institutions, but I love UCSD. And uh, where, um, actually, it's nice to be back in the home of Qualcomm. Uh, so I was a Qualcomm wireless health scholar when this field was called wireless health back uh, 12 years ago. Uh, you know, tasked with developing new clinical trial designs for wearable, wireless, ingestible, mobile health technologies. I uh, did clinical trials uh, across the United States, in, uh, in Africa, India, Mexico, really to see how do we implement in different settings uh, and then translate those to patient care uh, here in the US and clinical cardiology and pregnancy and others. Uh, I later served as a senior medical officer for digital health and artificial intelligence at the Food and Drug Administration, uh, working on digital health policy. How do we start thinking about this more broadly? Right. And, and that future of, you know, where are these technologies going and how can they be developed? The main things I'm interested in at this point are let's improve access, uh, some portions of efficiencies related to healthcare, and, and you know, cross industry collaborations for how do we get to some of the real pain points of, uh, of healthcare delivery in the country. Tanvir. Thank you. Uh, I'm Tanvir Saida Mahmood. I'm from an IBM fellow at IBM Research. Uh, and I guess I'm a long-term student of AI, probably about 40 years now, having gone through the ups and downs of AI. In fact, when I came to the AI lab at MIT for my PhD in 1988, I was told AI is over, you came too late. So, <laughs> <laughs> and now here we are. Uh, yes, we've gone through many, uh, in the fields of AI from robotics, if you see the Roombas uh, around to, uh, you know, computer vision to the last 20 plus years in healthcare and uh, we from the healthcare perspective we came with the idea of augmented intelligence uh, to clinicians in terms of uh, giving them aid to diagnosis and uh, primarily we came from a computer aided diagnosis perspective but we realized that there are many other ways of delivering AI that could also be even lower hanging fruit uh, as you go so our goal has been to get these tools in the hands of clinicians that would impact clinical care, and uh, that's where we still strive to do uh, as, as we evolve. Great. Thanks. Go ahead. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Drew Hall. I'm a professor here at UCSD in the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department. I'm part of the Center for Wireless Communications, as well as the Center for Wireless Sensors, and an affiliate faculty in the Bioengineering Department. My research interests are on the intersection of circuits and the life sciences. So I work on a lot of biosensors, biochips, uh, medical or short range radios, um, and high performance data converters. Um, so 
I'm here on the panel today to talk about some of the sensors that, that you might use and designing them and thinking a little more futuristically about them. Thanks. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, my name is Alex Gao. Uh, I'm the Chief Strategy Officer for <laughs> Health Unity. It's an open research consortium that focusing on using Gen AI and digital health for uh, health delivery transformation. And uh, prior to this role, I found and led Samsung Digital Health Lab for about seven years, during which we focus on developing novel uh, evidence-based digital biomarkers and uh, piloting using uh, uh, patient-centric uh, design thinking method piloting health services, as well as using a large language model, Gen AI, to develop health coaching. It's great to be here. Thanks, you, Alex. Adil? Uh, hello, everyone. So I'm uh, Adil Akhtar. I'm the CEO and founder of Psionic. We develop advanced bionic limbs that are affordable for both humans and robots. Um, and so this is something I wanted to do my whole life ever since I was seven years old, was build bionic limbs. Uh, we have over 150 patients using the hand. The hand is covered by Medicare. It's, there's a lot of sensing technologies in here. So it's the first hand on the market with touch sensing. So our patients can actually feel from it. And we can uh, wi or, uh, transmit that wirelessly over Bluetooth or other paradigms as well, too, um, to give users uh, uh, opportunities to teleoperate the robot or just use it directly connected to their nervous system uh, as well. Um, NASA has been using the hand. They want to send it on, uh, up into space on a humanoid astronaut robot that we can teleoperate there um, as well, too. And we've connected with like brain implants and things like that. So lots of different communication paradigms happening with, with all the same um, uh, robotic product here. And so we just moved to San Diego about a year and a half ago and we're working with the military hospital in town. I'm affiliate faculty in bioengineering here at UCSD um, as well, and we're working with the hand surgeons and orthopedic surgeons to for the next generation of these devices that will be directly attached to people's bones and their nerves um, so that we might have our first patients playing piano in about a year and a half to two years. Thanks, Adil. So Adil hid one piece of information, and that is uh, he's the first uh, person that I've met in person who is a Shark Tank winner. <laughs> and so I'm going to ask him that how did he how did he become the winner? What is the demonstration that you gave that Mr. Wonderful chose to uh, invest in you? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And so... Um, uh, can you can you show me a demo of that? Yeah, absolutely. And so I was mentioning that typically these are uh, these hands are controlled by your muscles, and and um, uh, right now the way they're clinically controlled, they use um, a pre-programmed grip. So I can do like a finger wave, or I can like switch that to doing like a thumbs up or like a key grip. But when we control our own hands, we actually do individual finger control. And so we're going to do something fun here. And so Sujit, if you actually put your hand in front of the camera here, okay, it'll not bite me. No, it, sh it shouldn't bite you. <laughs> okay. So let's see if I can get that. Yep. So if you back up just a little bit more right there. Okay, and bend your fingers. Then you're actually controlling the hand wirelessly. Um, and see. it's mimicking exactly what your hand is doing. Okay. And so this is what we want to do both via teleoperation and with nerve implants. Okay, that's great. <laughs> so let me, let me follow up on this. So this is a perfect example of uh, how sensing, right? Uh, machine vision, I'm assuming that there's a lot of machine vision here, machine vision, artificial intelligence and some form of communication is working out here, right? So this is, this is a great example of uh, innovations that might come because these three things come together. So let me ask you this, what are your current, um, uh, you mentioned about some adoptions, uh, looking into the future, so you did this where I'm right here. Can you do this today with, uh, and there's haptics also involved, right? Because, so can you do this today? Uh, suppose I were in New York City, and you know, and this is in the hands. This is in my hands. Maybe I'm, I'm the, I'm, you know, I'm doing rehab, and a doctor here is instructing me what to do, or a clinician or a physical therapist. Can that work out? Yeah, and so um, we've actually done Zoom calls with people where they just put their hand in front of the camera. And actually, this morning I had someone from New York actually control our oh, hand really? in San Diego um, as well too, which is really cool. But the thing is, is latency is definitely an issue when it comes to that, right? I mean, and if we're talking about things like, uh, you know, some of the best examples of of like low latency, high performance things are like FPV drone racing, right? Where you put on that headset and then like you're you're controlling like a high speed drone in real time. And I mean, those latencies are like, you know, sub one millisecond. What right? is, what would be the latency requirement? Suppose 
you know, this is a research challenge that you're throwing out, guys. You know, get me a network, wireless network with this kind of latency and this kind of whatever it is. What are the requirements? Yeah, and so in this short distance communication that we were doing. No, I'm talking of long distance. No, no, I know, I yeah. know. So, but that example that you did, that was about a 10 millisecond latency between like uh, over Bluetooth low energy, okay. right? Um, and the thing is, is that you're not going to get a 10 millisecond latency if you're if you're in New yeah. York in between here. So, I mean, if that's something that we could achieve is like at 10 milliseconds, because we know that this has actually worked for people in person and for doing like rehabilitation purposes mm -hmm. stuff. So if you want to do rehabilitation over that, that, that long distance, if we could get that same level of, of latency where it's just like a 10 millisecond delay, I, again, I, I'm not a wireless expert, so I don't know how achievable that is, but that's a challenge to all the wireless experts that are here is whether we could do like a long distance, like sub 10 millisecond controlling a hand wirelessly. But that has implications beyond just like rehabilitation. I mean, robotic surgery, for mm -hmm. example, being able to do that with like precision instruments. Um, we've got um, people like Mercedes has our hand there building cars, for example. And if they can do a lot of that stuff remotely with robots and give those instructions um, over a distance, having something like sub 10 milliseconds, I think. Would be really so that's a challenge to all of us, right? And uh, as you know that, you know, when 5G came, uh, the advertisement was all over and care people from Nokia and Ericsson and others, you know, it's one millisecond latency or whatever, but that's when you hug the base station. But when you're away from the base station, you know, all bits <laughs> are off. Uh, Drew, going to you. So in terms of sensing, so, you know, you specialize in wireless sensing technologies, right? And uh, one of the other aspects is power. So whenever we are talking of sensing, you know, we are also taking, talking of power. How low can power go and, uh, you know, with your group, the research that you are doing, but you know other research that is going on, uh, can it be zero battery sensing at some point? What what is the kind of power that you know your sensors need, and what is the roadmap? Yeah, so Suja, great question. Um, you, you know, there's a lot of different requirements when you talk about sensor power. You know, for one example, if you wanted to connect the bionic hand to a neural stimulator, the power there is obviously much higher because you're stimulating the brain probably recording neural activity at the same time to, to form a closed loop situation. You can also think about wearable sensors that are monitoring, for example, biochemical signals, monitoring stress, monitoring you know, any number of different uh, physiochemical aspects of life. And there I think that you really leverage a lot of the fact that biology is slow compared to electronics. And so you don't need to sample this typically on the 10 millisecond time frame, it's more on the 10 minute time frame. And so duty cycling really allows you to, to reduce power there. So you can trade off. Absolutely. Um, you know, to kind of put some numbers and give you some examples of things that we've done in the past, um, we've actually developed one of the, the lowest power injectable biosensors that's ever been reported. So this was less than a microwatt of power injected subcutaneously under the skin and it, the wirelessly received power and wirelessly transmitted the data back. And so I think that there's a lot of opportunities coming up um, in this space in particular that have not really been tapped on the healthcare side of sensors um, that we're only really starting to get figured out due to the regulatory pathway that sits in between a lot of these. So Sanjeev, uh, you have a lot of experience in, you know, in using mobile technologies uh, for uh, remote patient monitoring and so on. You have run a big uh, pilot there, you know, I remember. Uh, so I'll, I'll ask you about adoption and security and, um, you know, regulatory issues later. But uh, let's say this implantable sensor, you know, which is wirelessly transmitting data mm -hmm. and uh, also receiving power wirelessly. And, you know, uh, in your field of cardiology, how does it open up potentially... Uh, new ways of thinking about it. So imagine that when you are doing your pilots with mobile technologies, and suppose these kind of technologies were also available or you know they are becoming available, how does it open up things from your experience running these mobile technology-based remote patient monitoring uh, pilots? No, it's a great question. Thanks, Sujit. And Sorry, and you know, I, I have not practiced any of these <laughs> questions with the with the panelists. I apologize to you, but it makes the panel much more free flowing and like you know interesting. And last panel of the day, it should be as interactive <laughs> as possible. Uh, congratulations on your on your progress as well. Uh, you know, at, at anything new that is you know a, a prospect ingestible as an example uh, for people. Uh, and that can be you know, people, consumers, patients, uh, will have a side of discovery 
to it. We're doing something new, monitoring a physiologic parameter or multiple physiologic parameters in a location we've never been able to do before, right? From a hospital setting now to a home, to an environment, to a where, where it might be. So we have the ability now to collect data and hopefully analyze it to identify new patterns of what's happening to health, what's happening to disease, what's happening to that change over time. So the discovery side of it, that then there is how are we identifying and making people better, right? So there should be a match, hopefully in a few of those areas, but even one is enough that this parameter is informing this particular disease state. And we have therapies, whether those be lifestyle, exercise, nutrition, you know, good, good health, or medications, surgeries, interventions that can be done earlier to now you know, mitigate, either halt that disease progression or hopefully reverse it. And that's the discovery portion of, uh, of reversing a disease process or preventing it from happening. So I think when this comes up, right, and it, it, it will center a lot on, you know, we said this, and it, it probably rings true to the audience as well, you know, the right parameter in the right patient, the person in the right time, right? And things have to come together like that. But that's where, you know, we hopefully figure it out. So to look from discovery to then the person and their disease. Thanks. Of time, I'm sorry. You have spent a lot of time, you know, your group developing multimodal AI models. Uh, you know, you continue to do that and apply to health. Uh, what has been your experience? What has been the impediments in terms of what are the technological challenges in terms of getting data, uh, fusing data? What are the technological challenges in terms of you know even uh, getting it in the hands of clinicians and so on, other other procedural challenges. Can you tell us a little bit about your experiences? Yeah, when we started working in clinical decision support back in maybe 2004, 2005 timeframe, there were no general electronic health records being yeah. used in hospitals. Uh, Kaiser was one of the few, Cedar sinai another, and so on. And... Um, you know, getting data out of these systems was a big issue in first place. So yeah, even if you wanted to do the analysis, so that was uh, and data integration and data exports and standardization still is a major problem for many of them. The second thing is understanding the clinicians' needs as to what exactly in what form do they need these type of systems. And if you worked in isolation, just building your models, your latest greatest AI models, if you do not interface with the, the community to understand what their needs are. You might build something they either don't need or it won't work for them, uh, and so they lose interest as well. So the adoption aspect of it has many different dimensions. The first and foremost is the functionality itself for these models, so building it to specs. And I'll give one single exa simple example. We have research going on in stent placements in uh, interventional cardiology practices where you have to get the diameter uh, measurement right. So to get AI to be so precise to locate the stents within coronary arteries and make sure that the measurements you're making are so precise within the few millimeters so that you're not under or oversizing the stent is very important. To get AI to be that precise requires considerable amount of research with right data and annotations, which becomes, and each of these could take several years of research to do. So that is one of the functionality aspect of it. The second is in what form do you deliver so it's easy for adoption? so that it integrates with the workflow. If there is something you have to do additional to go and actually make it work, uh, or, in, or somebody else has to do that, it's not going to happen. So the integration with the workflow, and if it disturbs the clinicians and lets them spend more time trying to you know, use this, they're not going to listen to that. So there are many barriers like that in getting AI adopted, which is one of the reasons why I think you might also talk about this, is the, the adoption of AI in, uh, in workflows has been low uh, because of some of these factors as well. So, so that's, those are some of the barriers I see for uh, AI. So, uh, Alex, uh, I'm uh, next going to talk to you a little bit about your past experiences. You know, as you said, you founded and led the digital health initiatives in Samsung. Uh, there, you know, from that experience, I'm going to ask you one question. 
And then another question I'm going to ask you from your health unity, you know, goals. From the health unity goals, you are going to, uh, you know, lead to generative AI models, especially for medicine. And, um, you know, so following up on what Tanvir was saying, you know, how you are sort of learning from the experiences in the past, generative AI is very exciting. You know, everyone is almost compelled to adopt it. So you have a, you know, real huge advantage now. But, uh, you know, there has been a lot of experience about, you know, getting AI in the hands of either patients or clinicians. How are you treading that line in terms of, uh, you know, you are the chief strategy officer. What is your strategy in terms of developing those models and getting them in the hands of, uh, in the workflow and so on? I, I think the society certainly benefit a lot of the pro proliferation of the, uh, the wearable technologies, mobile technologies, fencing. So there are multiple data streams coming continuously. It really provide a, a holistic picture of people or patient, how we live our life. We can now measure the overall daily activities, uh, the sleep onset, offset, sleep stage classifications, breathing rate. So some of these, if uh, the mirage of uh, biomarkers combined can be used for a COPD exacerbation prediction, congestion, heart failure, exacerbation, asthma attack. So these are some of the um, uh, prognostic application benefit from the, the data. I think the LLM, the Gen AI coming in, in the sense of now we have a very rich set of data continuously on top of EHR, EMR, which um, is hard to get access to, but also a lot of study indicate that is there not as much value compared to a continuous way monitoring uh, people and how we live our life. And if you combine this with uh, the Gen AI LLM, it's really uh, now you have the full context of patient and you can develop much more personalized interactions with them. And more importantly, instead of a, a traditional Q&A fashion, now by, by knowing the context, your behavioral, physiological the system and the, the algorithm will be able to identify the right moment to initiate the conversation and the q and A, I I think that's extremely powerful, right? I think the, um, a lot of technology development is uh, evolving, but we're in a very fast pacing evolution stage. And if I may follow up and ask you about your Samsung experiences, uh, you know, irrespective of the NDAs that you might have signed and things like that, what is a roadmap that we can expect to see in terms of mobile technologies uh, incorporating in them sensing technology. So, you know, in our watches, in our patches, in the rings, in the mobile phones, you know, what is coming? Yeah. So so right now, I think by 2025, the estimated uh, we will probably globally have five, uh, close to 2 billion phones sold per year, 500 million earbuds, um, maybe approximately near 200 million smart watch, 10 million uh, smart rings. So we can see there are really man many di different ways of measuring. So how to add this health wellness feature to these uh, wearables because it's always on and next to the, uh, the people, how to cr use these data, po data points, wave into a cohesive uh, understanding of the patient and identify opportunity for engagement, according to care. Um, so you name it, everything that from more accurately uh, identify the, the, the sleep onset offset, uh, uh, more accurately to stage classification, can we passively monitoring the, the AFib burden? Can we predict uh, COPD exacerbation or seizure uh, taking place minutes or tens of minutes before it take place? So all these are very powerful applications. So you will see a, not only Samsung, any device manufacturers are having a roadmap, array of these kind of biomarkers being under development. And those can, would be feed into a large language model Gen AI to, uh, for innovative uh, applications. So Alex, uh, keeping with you, because you are in a very unique position, you know, of all our panelists here, because, uh, you know, you, you know wireless very well, you know sensing very well, and you know all these biomarkers, applications, wellness, you know, you have, you have worked with all of these. What are the, what would be your ask from uh, wireless companies or, you know, both from a infrastructure perspective, from, device perspective, do you, would you have a wish list now that you are in a new role? What what would be the, and again, uh, I apologize to you guys, but you know, I've not talked about any of these questions, it's just free flowing in me, okay? So I'm not putting on, on any, in any spot, 
but what do you think uh, what are what are the as what what can happen I, I besides think... all the uh someone use the word marketing you know 5g 6g all these things what are the what are the things that can be delivered in the next several years which will make it even more accessible for patients and for caregivers to use digital health technologies right i i think if definitely for the uh, power assumption uh consumption is need to be low in order for the wearable to be uh, always on continuously right now the earbuds can only last for four hours and the, the smart watch with uh, fancy applications maybe two days but if you do start cycling uh, sampling in a continuous fashion it will drain the battery a lot faster uh, i would also say the the some of the sensing capabilities can we develop the capability for future non-invasive glucose monitoring one of the holy grail can we do um, uh, the cuffless blood pressure, right? So these are the things are are, are the challenges. Um, that definitely I, at the uh, a, a LLM and Gen AI level, how we reduce hallucination, make sure the uh, the clinical efficacy is high. From digital biomarker development point of view, how we make sure the total uh, dynamic range, the data. Uh, when we develop the biomarkers uh, are more inclusive, not on a specific uh, population, right? So that the biomarker isn't fully tested and validated. So I think the list is long, but I, there are so many like-minded people and we're all collectively uh, pushing forward, yeah. Right. So uh, we, we have time left, but you know, I would like to encourage the audience to participate and, you know, have their questions. Anytime you have any questions, I see a question from Ashu. Yes, please. Um, thank you very much. Your great comments. Um, um, so there is an example. And we're just getting started. They're just getting started. <laughs> and maybe I'll start the part a little bit. Um, you know, there is a great example of a, a wearable which is extremely successful, saves millions of lives, just continuous glucose monitor and has been major, major impact in diabetes. Um, and I would say the reason it worked really well is because it is measuring exactly what needed to be measured, which is a glucose. I mean, we would love to measure insulin, we can't, so that's a proxy we measure glucose. Um, but the, if you look at the literature for digital markers, so there's a skeptical side of me, where everybody decided, every condition decided, let's put smartwatch, measure something, we will find a marker for disease A, B, C, D, E, F, G. It correlates with everything. It's just so non-specific. As long as you're breathing, it'll correlate with anything you are. <laughs> so um, I wanted to see if you are seeing real success in something. I know it may not be adopted in clinical practice, but are they specific? Are they specific enough that it will actually translate into practice? I don't know who. Yes. Martin. Stir the pot, indeed. Right. Um, you know, th this is this is more the. Uh, the uh, sort of practical nature of developing a new a new digital marker, a phenotype, a surrogate, and it is extremely challenging. I think the way that uh, we see, you know, how these models are created, uh, that single prediction models will probably do pretty well, right? It, if trained on large enough data sets, and I, I absolutely agree that. CGM worked because it was a direct marker of something that could be, it's measurable, it's meaningful, it's modifiable, <laughs> right? Glucose with lifestyle, with treatment. So it worked, it, it connected the dots with all three of these. So that digital biomarker of the CGM sensed glucose transdermal or it into, into fat cells worked, right? How do we replicate that type of model for any new digital biomarker or a, 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 a machine learned phenotype, because you're right, there will be a lot that it can predict, but there will be very little that it will predict very well, right? And then that very well translates into, we understand this person's risk and we have A, B or C available to us now, maybe D, E and F in the future to be able to then get to that last M modify it right so um hopefully hopefully a a opportunity to developers academia you know industry to we're at a phase right now with 
the advent of new um, uh, machine learning models, right? And, you know, ensemble models and things that are getting much more complicated um, and complex. But how do we do that now in a way that we know translates? So I think a very good question and not everything will work the way that we plan that it will. It's one of those things where, you know, domain knowledge is still relevant. Mm -hmm. One would think data tool, if you had enough data, you could, um, you know, substitute for domain knowledge. But there is a balance, and I think we are hitting that balance now when we put generative AI into practice, particularly in medicine. Even if you take synthetic data generation methods like diffusion models, to get a diffusion model to elicit a specific pathology is very difficult. Um, but looking, making it look like a chest X-ray, no problem, right? <laughs> but if you want to, uh, you know, inject a specific disease in a specific location, then that requires further understanding of the disease uh, incorporated into the models. So that's where I think the the next generation of work in these type of models is going to be how to best incorporate domain knowledge. And that might answer mm -hmm. some of the questions about larger versus smaller models. Sometimes people have found that um, that trade-off could be made in here as well. So overall, it comes down to AI being good for uh, that specific task. And you can make it good for very specific things that are the low-hanging fruit. But to get to the full spectrum, the field is still open. So as the sensor guy, I have to agree with your skepticism that you're ever going to get high specificity from these general purpose markers. And I think that it's only going to come when you augment this with more specificity. I mm -hmm. mean, the CGM is a great example, but it's very specific. It senses glucose. It doesn't tell you your blood glucose from your heart rate, right? I, I think that the wearable has been the low hanging fruit. It's easy, uh, but it, it's not rich enough in some of the data to really do what, what we want to do. And that's only going to come when you start to augment that with specific sensors. So I've tried to steer the panel back to the consciousness that there's a wireless conference, uh, you know, and would love to engage with you in a non-wireless way, going into the biological sciences and so on. I would like to ask the panel, uh, so, you know, we have a lot of excitement going on in RF sensing, uh, you know, and uh, what, what you think would be the utility of RF sensing going to the future? So, for instance, you know, in sensing how I'm sleeping, you know, you mentioned I was sleep multiple times. Uh, we don't need to then uh, resort to sleep apnea machines and you know other ways of sensing you know in terms of my HRV. What, what do you think of the promise of RF sensing? Anyone? anyone? I mean, I think that it's a really interesting space. So I'll give one example of one of my colleagues at the University of Washington. Um, he uses RF sensing to mo to monitor opioid use. And so they, they use this to monitor opioid distress, um, respiratory problems. Um, I think it's a really interesting opportunity. Um, I worry that it's not, again, going to give you quite as much data as you would like. I and mean, also from, the accuracy aspect. Exactly. I mean, I, I think that there's always going to be some air bound here and, you know, detecting if your breathing is going down by whatever, 50% probably, but 2% for yeah. sleep apnea, as you mentioned, probably not. And so I, I think that you still need to be a little closer to the patient or user for some of the applications. Mm -hmm. I saw a hand going up somewhere before. Yes. Yes, Dinesh. Go ahead. Sujit, I might continue to stir a little bit the pot and maybe even go off wireless and ask. Um, so digital health, I think these are good gimmicks from my point of view, right? I think the transformative impact I do think is that how do we make healthcare cheaper and more accessible, right? And how does this digital health as such help in that that larger venture, right? Uh, maybe I think uh, it may go off wireless, but I want to see as a wireless researcher, like truly what can I solve and where am I contributing if at all? Well, your question is very relevant. I mean, you know, if you think of adoption, all the hospital systems will care about is how to get the cost of care lower. So any, any uh, Sanjeev, uh, Adil, because you have been working with health systems, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, so... What do you think in terms of, you know, the cost they are willing to pay and so on? Yeah, and uh, I mean, when we were designing the hand, um, when we did our initial, like, um, the 
talks with like clinicians and, and patients, the, basically the payers, um, the, their goal was that if we could get a hand covered by Medicare, then that would be the gold standard. Because if Medicare covers it, then usually all the in other insurance companies follow suit. And in order to do that, the, the clinicians needed to be able to double their margins. So that basically gave us the design requirements from the beginning that, okay, this is going to be the, uh, the price point that we need to hit. This will be the cost structure that we'll need to hit in order to make a company that's going to be viable. And uh, when we looked at it through that lens, that restricted a lot of the, the technologies that we could pursue. And it actually forced us to think in different ways and like, how can we make something that's more advanced than anything else, but then is also much more cost effective to make than any other um, device too. And so we had to like, uh, we invented like new 3D printing processes where we could 3D print molds and inject silicone into those 3D printed molds as opposed to doing like much more expensive manufacturing solutions. And so again, I know this is a, a stray from like wireless and this is more hardware based, but I think the the, the overall general point is that if um, if we approach these research questions um, from a lens of these are the constraints that you cannot go above these costs in order to make a, something more accessible at a wider level, then it'll force you to think in a different way that you need to design the system itself so that it won't be an, a large expense, um, especially at volume. And on the other hand, uh, if I may also say that uh, you know, one of the things that is definitely going to happen, and hopefully uh, the panel will agree, that using generative AI and, you know, various other AI, right? We keep saying generative AI, using AI techniques uh, that how to reduce, how to improve the workflow within, you know, clinic systems and how to reduce the care burden uh, is, you know, is definitely going to be two things that people are looking at. You know, I know that multiple companies looking at and so on. So, Sanjeev, uh, so someone comes to script uh, saying that they have a, this amazing product or someone comes to script saying that uh, I have this and as Adil was saying that it might not be the, the most optimized product but it reduces the care burden, it reduces the, uh, you know, it improves the care efficiency. Which one will get more adopted? And what would be the, what would you advise to people who would like to develop new technologies, develop new digital health products mm -hmm to do in terms of getting adopted? What, yeah, so from efficiency perspective as well as uh, reducing the cost of care perspective. Sure, and um, extends from the stir the pot. Uh, so I'll hopefully stir the pot a little bit more with the answer uh, that what are you solving for, right? Um, that's where where it must start. And so um, I pose this net actually also to my, to my fellow panelists. Uh, when looking at the prospect for a new AI tool or ML algorithm or a device, or a digital health device, um, if you, we simply just look at a two by two uh, table, right? Uh, and on the, on the bottom, you put what a human does, right? What is easy for a human, what is hard for a human. And on this side, uh, this, this axis, you put what is easy for AI and what is hard for AI. So what is easy for any human, human being, that could be the workflow of a patient, that could be the workflow of a physician, that could be whatever it is, should be easy for AI to replicate, if not make any better. So as far as any low hanging fruit, don't like the term, everything requires a lot of work. Um, that, that is there, right? And that is identified in what are you solving for? Where do we wanna go, right? We wanna go with this to what is hard for humans and potentially easy for AI, right? So what is hard for humans, I think I, I have not been able to put anything into that box until I met you, right? Uh, what is hard is exactly what you are solved for, you're solving for, right? And aug uh, augmenting a task for a human, a patient, a person, a technologist, a surgeon, that is very difficult, but to do it with with a device and an algorithm that is more precise and potentially easier. We want to get there. So I think for anyone that comes and is building something, you understand what you're solving for, but identify what is the task optimization that is the solution. And laser point on that, whether it's a better diagnostic tool, a better triage tool, a better identification tool for treatment, in this, these types of categories that it's not precise with what we're doing inside hospitals, but this is what the algorithm can do to make it better. 
I think many times it's not the cost, it's not the, right. uh, I think it will boil down to the completeness of the functionality and the functionality itself. I mean, there are many things that are very costly in medicine and people do spend the money to get those, like scanners and those sort of devices. So, so I think when they see the value and utility of something, they would spend on AI. But when we did value propositions during Watson, uh, Watson Health times for designing products and so on, um, you know, there is good business justifications like first readers for imaging so that you save the time that the clinicians actually focus on the right patients instead of the normal ones that they can basically mm -hmm. filter. Um, that works well, provided you provide, give a tool that can guarantee that there's no abnormal case that would be dropped. And obtaining that guarantee itself is a tall proposition for AI. So again, it boils down to the functionality. Could you implement that in a stage that is a no-brainer that you can actually get down to? Very few diseases that has been able to uh, people have been able to achieve for that. So I think eventually it will come down to um, and how it fits in the workflow, which is another example I gave. If you had to babysit it, if you can only solve five of the diseases, like in chest X-rays, most people will, five findings or 14 findings. What about the rest? I still have to write my report. But there are some use cases with generative AI where now you can think of if the, uh, the language description has evolved to the extent that you can automate it, a report and you can ensure clinical correctness of it, one can see the value proposition in, in the clinical workflows because writing reports is one of the major pain points. It's not difficult for humans, but it's boring and it is not, you know, it's not a fun task for them. So if that's something that could be automated, that would have been good. But again, we come down to, can we guarantee that the report is clinically correct? And, and so that's where the, so I think ultimately it is coming down to more technological innovations needed before we can get to, uh, you know, at the kind of adoption we need to see in healthcare. But point-wise, you will still make progress. Can I stir the pot yeah. a little bit yes. more? Uh, I like that stir the pot for the last, last topic. Um, in designing for people, right, and, and now with patients in mind, when you ask, and one of my colleagues, Dr. Beckers, is a, a, a transplant surgeon is here, she may agree with me, that... When you ask patients and people, we have this new digital tool or this new algorithm, what do you think? Like when I asked my patients when we were defining digital health and Wikipedia we took, our, we took our definition and put it there, um, that almost uniformly people said, I don't know what you're talking about, but if it is a better way for you to communicate with me, then that's, that's digital transformation. And that doesn't, that can mean that what are you solving for, right? That is post-hospital discharge instructions. That is, how do I get my lab tests done at home instead of, you know, 50 miles away in a clinic, right? Monitoring blood pressure, you know, 30 times a month, once a day versus coming to clinic twice a year. Is that, that, that data, that participation is communicating the health information better that can lead to then decisions. And I thought that was a very, you know, it was a moment of pause when people said that because it helped define, right? What are we solving for? And if it is a way to better communicate this information, well, that's a good place for us to start and hopefully finish. Yeah, yeah. I, I have some observation I'd like to share. Usually in a digital transformation, you don't necessarily start from a, a technology or an algorithm. You look at it, what problem you're solving, and uh, there are many, many right problems to be solved in healthcare, but not a whole lot of them have a budget pool already assigned, priority already uh, assigned to it. As a startup, as a technologist, focus on those problems, not only the right problem to solve, but also have a budget pool mm -hmm. already allocated. You can, you can have a developer solution cannibalizing the existing solution. Don't focus on the absolutely right problem to solve because if there's no money attached to it, you won't, it won't matter, right? It would take way too long, especially in the technology world where our product life cycle is every six to nine months versus healthcare is even a sales cycle can be 18 months. A CPT code issue, uh, issuing can be three to four years, if not longer. 
so that's I think something that I'd like to share with especially okay. the entrepreneurs. Yeah. So there is a question. We are starting to run out of time. Thank you. Sujit, I'm gonna try to help you to bring this back to wireless. Yes. Because <laughs> <Okay. laughs> this is going too much into the uh, I think it, with 6G, uh, we, we kind of know that you know the sub terahertz frequencies, you know, is kind of like a far far fetched out dream for communication. But what can we do for health with the, with sub, uh, you know, sub terahertz frequencies for sensing and stuff like that. Any ideas? You're talking of applications. Yes. So, you know, uh, one of the things as I was listening to Sanjeev, it came to my mind because I associate with a lot of healthcare providers. Uh, one of the enthusiasm Sanjeev I'm seeing is in ambient uh, transcribing because, you know, one of the things that doctors don't like to do, but they're forced to do is do a lot of note taking after a patient leaves. And sometimes, you know, they're doing it on the weekends also, believe me or not. So if if there's something listening to everything and just transcribing for them, that would be really good. And I feel that, you know, a lot of um, uh, RF sensing and, you know, terahertz aspects of it can come to bear there because, you know, the whole thing is accuracy there, right? Imagine that this ambient sensing is transcribing and doing something transcribing wrong, that can be a huge liability issue. So I think that is that is one area that uh, I think can have applications of everything that we are doing. I, I don't know uh, about you guys. How about how about you? Any uh, any other thoughts? RF or millimeter wave have uh, the uh, uh, the potential to do some like a, a pulse rate detection. Uh, what detection? Sorry. Pulse rate okay. uh, yeah. or breathing yeah. rate, mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, we also see some people in using telehers claiming they may be able to uh, do a non-invasive glucose monitor, but those are not enough literature affiliated with that claim. It's mostly uh, association, right, not causal. Um, but these are the promises, right? But I agree with uh, Sujit. I think if uh, the ambient environment is already there, if we can help transcribe like the ADL, right, the automatic uh, the da daily living, uh, that would be wonderful because that can be feed into um, a Gen AI large language model yeah, and think to help of, by better engagement. Think of hospital beds, right? Um, that, you know, how many of the hospital beds are really supervised? Uh, different countries have different kinds of rules. You know, in some countries you pay huge amounts of money to get attention. Uh, you get your own personal, whoever, and so on. Uh, you know, the promise there about... Uh, you know, essentially, I don't know, ambient uh, overseeing of patients, right? About how patients are doing and, uh, you know, sending notifications. So imagine that uh, someone is in a hospital bed and something is constantly watching over and making sure that they are doing well. I mean, there are, I think that, you know, uh, there are various different applications that will come up in the next two, three, four, five I mean, There years. is a field of ambient AI I mean, that yeah. actually deals with these. And uh, in fact, one aspect that hasn't been mentioned so far is uh, the use of tools like those as against cameras, which have privacy issues. So so there are, um, uh, you know, provisions for technologies that are not- Use LiDAR technologies, for instance. So things like those are heat-based sensors, things like that, that you can still use as uh, surrogates for something that you cannot, you're not allowed to see then you might be able to monitor patients through that as well. And those are things that are being explored in the field of ambient intelligence. Is there an opportunity for that or as wireless, right, uh, to do uh, in-home sensing? Like yes. So as you know, Sanjeev, homes? that you know, uh, so many hospital systems are now trying out hospital at home as a caregiving paradigm, uh, not to replace anything, but to supplement everything that is going on. And so there, there, there can be a lot of applications of wireless sensing, essentially, not in not RF sensing, but you know, combining wireless and sensing. I mean, the future, as I see it, is if you are able to collect the data seamlessly through these sensing technologies and integrate it with the analysis piece, and the two synergistically can evolve to much, uh, you know, much more enhanced services in future. One such thing that you know we've been doing research is in augmenting memories to memory impaired patients, and and in those situations, if we could do silent gathering of information, as if uh, using the way they would have used their senses, but then feed them back 
from a recollection standpoint, that's one application where sensing technology could have made a difference. Of course, that needs to be augmented with sufficient computer vision and sufficient uh, you know, audio understanding and so on to be able to get to that point. But if the technologies evolve, you could imagine doing even more augmentation uh, with these uh, co in combination. So uh, I, I want to throw this th uh, this uh, situation out there too, especially as um, we see more things like you know Neuralink and brain implants uh, coming out as well too. So the the density of these implants, right, that are recording from your brain or your peripheral nerves and things like that. I mean, th the they're getting much much larger, right? From like 1,024 channels to like I, I read some new brain machine interface company that has like 4,000 channels that they're recording from, right, at a very high like bandwidth, right, that like uh, like one kilohertz or something like that. That is a lot of data, right? And to process all that data, if, if you need to control like a device like a wheelchair or a bionic hand or anything in real time, it requires a lot of processing power. And all of that, that machine learning because of the latency has to be done on the edge. So you're, you're gonna be connecting it to some sort of processor, whether it be like a, a Qualcomm Snapdragon or like whatever, an ARM Cortex or whatever, um, on the edge. And the thing is, is that that really limits your processing power, right? If you have all this data coming in, but you can only like compute it on like this, this small chip at the edge, then you might not get like the precision that you want, but you have to do that because you need to do this in real time. But if with 6G technology or, or whatever um, uh, wireless technologies that are coming out in the future, if we can offload that compute quickly enough to do it in the cloud and then give you the response of what the, the output should actually be in a, in a timely manner, I think that would be a huge game changer. And you were mentioning power saving like as yeah. being a, a huge feature. That, that is one way to mitigate the power saving because you're offloading that uh, onto the cloud. And I, I don't know if 6G will, will get, to the, get us to that point um, with, in terms of like speeds and bandwidth um, for us to do that compute and get it fast enough to control something in real time. But I think that would be definitely like a grand challenge as well too, that if we could get to that point. That, that's a great example. And, you know, I can speak from firsthand experience on this because I'm part of a large NIH funded program here at UCSD to develop neural implants for recording. And we are developing a 4,000 channel <laughs> implant. Um, and it is transmitting actually at much higher bandwidth. It's at 20 kilosamples per second. And the amount of data that comes off is, is astronomical when you think about this. And you're absolutely right. It, it's not the sensor that's taking the power. It's all of the computation and then the wireless transmission of this. And so if there are technologies that we can start to tap into to reduce that, then you can start to even further increase the channel count more. You can do lots of other things with that. We ran running out of time, ran out of time. <laughs> uh, I couldn't get to uh, data, data privacy, security, trust. I could not uh, avail of uh, Sanjeev's expertise in FDA because he uh, had a tenure at FDA, you know, just, just very recently. But we'll have to leave it to another discussion. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I will close this session. Thanks to all the panelists. And uh, I'll just give a couple of closing remarks to end the, end the program. Thank you.